Thank you, Warren, and good morning, everyone. We are in Proverbs chapter 31, and I was just told that this is message number 151 of the book of Proverbs. We actually started in 2016, and uh, we're now one lesson away from concluding the book. We will, we will uh, say a couple of brief uh, comments about verse 19 and get to 27, Lord willing, this morning, and then the final wrap-up of the book uh, next time we're together. I want you to know how much I love you uh, for being here this morning. I left Santa Barbara, California at 71 degrees to come back here and be with you. And this is lovely. I, I thought I was going to have to have uh, an oxygen treatment just to get across the parking lot today. Uh, the older I get, this heat is getting to me. Um, we have moved in this uh, study of the virtuous woman the woman of great strength, and that's the way she's pictured for us, uh, and her greatness by her strength and not her looks, which is quite opposite from the world. Uh, and we've moved now from her production, and that was verses 13 through 18, to now her technical know-how. And we address that as the last proverb when we were together uh, in our last lesson. Uh, and beginning in verse 19, what we see constantly emphasized is her hands. Watch her hands. Her hands are visible. Her hands are always moving. And that is the reoccurring theme that you see in these Proverbs. So uh, I just will make a couple of brief comments about verse 19 and then uh, read the rest of this text. And the reason I'm, I'm making this brief comment is I was in California with my daughter and she had, uh, she graduated from Chicago Art Institute in textiles. And I didn't really know very much about textiles or anything like that. Her project that took her a year and a half was to make and weave and make the thread and weave the thread of a carpet and uh, a rug. And uh, so I, it's a very intricate uh, rug, carpet. Uh, throw rug, whatever you would call it. And uh, so I said, you know, I just finished in Proverbs verse 19. And uh, while you're here, I'd like to uh, tap your mind uh, about uh, your rug. You have, you have one, uh, an inch and a half, two inches in... Uh, one certain structure, and then, then another inch is a different structure, and another inch is a different structure, and then you're back to the third structure. I said, explain to me just exactly how you do that. And she said, well, Dad, that's just the warp, W-A-R-P, and the weft, W-E-F-T. And I said... I don't know what you're talking about. And she said, well, you always told me, look it up. So look it up, Dad. <laughs> so I, that was, that's my lesson for verse 19. I looked it up. There it is. And I have no idea what it is. But that's uh, weaving for you. Now we'll begin in verse 20. Her hands she spreads out to the poor, and she holds out her hands to the needy. Verse 21, 
She is not afraid for her household on account of snow, for all her household is covered in scarlet. Verse 22, coverlets she makes for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and wool dyed with purple. 23, her husband is respected at the city gate when he sits down with the elders of the land. 24, garments she makes and sells sashes she supplies to the merchants. 25, strength and majesty are her clothing and she laughs at the coming days. 26, her mouth is open with wisdom and with, we could translate this, loving kindness, loving teaching, loving instruction. All of those would be an accurate translation because it's hesed. It's the covenant loyalty of God revealing himself to Israel. This is the way he is in loving kindness. We sing in loving kindness. And so loving teaching, loving instruction, loving kindness is on her tongue. Verse 27 she watches over the affairs. Now, I you know you have household. That's not in the inspired language, but we, that's the implied idea. That's why you have it there. But it literally reads, she, she watches over the affairs, the food of idleness she does not eat. So, we begin our exposition this morning. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 31, beginning in verse 20. The skilled activity of her hands brings credibility to the wisdom of her life. This is the equivalent of our letter K. Remember, we're doing this is all an acrostic format. You have the Hebrew letter followed by the verse. It is a, a mechanism to help you to memorize it. It is a mechanism to help you ref, reference it like we do verse 1, verse 2, verse 3. They didn't have that. But they did put in some of these acrostics, and this is one, uh, these Hebrew letters. And this is the K. Look at the parallels in the, in the verse. She spreads out, that's line one. She holds out, that's line two. We open here with she spreads out her palms or her hands. So she's extending herself to the needs of the weak, the destitute who live day to day. They are the poor of the land. They suffer want, matching the needy of line two. What's the picture here? That she is, her hands are in activity. She is sensitive. She is concerned with and she is giving to the use of her hands. I need to say something at this point because it moves out of the context of the virtuous woman to the virtuous church. Believer's Chapel, for example. There is no quid pro quo a this for that at Believer's Chapel. There never has been. And as long as the elders that we have are here, there never will be. A this for that. Not here. Not this place. Um, you go to churches and it's, uh, well, 
sign up for this. Get on that. Be on a committee for this or that. We need your pledge in order to build the building. Uh, we need to take that to the financial institution so that we can leverage our dollars in order to build or to make something. You don't have that here, and you never will, as long as these elders are here. Uh, this is not a quid pro quo. This is not, what do you give us? The ministry of God in the church is giving out. And that's what you have, and you will always have at Believer's Chapel. The Word of God is free. It, it comes with no hidden agenda. It's free. It's delivered to you. Uh, in freedom and the spirit of freedom. Nobody requires of you, not here, not in this place, because you're treated like you are described in the epistle to the Hebrews as a believer priest. You're a priest. That's the way you're treated. And that's the way you're ministered to. Now, what does that actually mean? Uh, apply that to me. Well, I'll apply it to you. Jesus said it this way at the end of Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8. He says, freely you have received, so freely give. Nobody puts compulsion on you. You are treated as a grown-up in the body of Christ, and you are moved and motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. That's what's going on here, and that's the vitality of this particular ministry. Now, why is that so important? Because when my father walked through the door of Believer's Chapel back in 1972, he kept saying to me, where do they pass the plate around here? Uh, where do you give, where do you write a check? Oh, how, do they, how do they run the building? They've got to pay for the lights and the air conditioning. How do they do that? It really stuck to him. But you see, that's the ministry that we're involved in. It's free. And it always will be. Because you are treated like a grown-up. You are motivated as a priest and you are not being called upon to do this for that or this for that. Not going to happen here. Never has. S. Lewis Johnson, if he ever rubber stamped something to my forehead, it's that the ministry of God's Word is free. And it is the most powerful force that's ever been created. Think about it. He spoke this world into existence. The power of His Word. All of the creation, all of the stars, all of the heavens, He spoke it. And that's what you're getting. You're getting that Word delivered to you, and it's changing you. You are the priest, the believer priest, in the body of Christ. And these teachers, these elders, this philosophy will not change. That's the way you are addressed. The power of the Word, the Word of power, it changes the individual. Here's 21. It's the equivalent to our letter L. She is not afraid for her household. Another list of this capable woman's ability. 
clothes she makes for the family. To me, this is an interesting opening, the way it's written. She is not afraid. And that's, that's, uh, I wasn't anticipating that. What's it really saying? Well, she is the anticipated danger of the cold. Cold. Don't we love that word, cold, today? I just, let's just think about cold for a minute. Now, uh, cold, it brings her no concern. See, like the diligent ant, she's already planned ahead and she's prepared. Snow in this region of Palestine comes in what is known as the rainy season. And that's from November to February. Now, line one, look at the parallel for her household and look at the parallel for line two, all her household. Four, the household refers to the, not only the immediate family, but beyond the family itself to all the servants and anyone that is associated with the clan the work that goes on. Crimson, that would be the color of the thread that is used. What does that tell us? It's costly. It didn't run to Costco and buy red thread. No, it had, you had to make the thread, then you had to dye the thread. This woman doesn't cut any corners. Everything about her daily activities tells us of her intricate detail. I, uh, Elizabeth Elliot helped me here. She had written the book, uh, A Chance to Die, The Life of Amy Carmichael. And Amy Carmichael saved a lot of children in India their lives by getting them out of the sex trade which was rampant and she took in all these orphans and then Elizabeth Elliot said this not only do you feed them and clothe them but she said think of all the little fingernails you have to clip every day to keep these children clean. Think about how much soap you have to have to take care of them and keep them clean. All the details. That's what you see here with this woman. She doesn't cut any corners. She treats all that are associated with her like the immediate family. Just another picture of her generosity. Watch her hands. Her hands are moving all the time. 22. This acrostic is our letter N. Coverlets. New American Standard translates it tapestry, bed coverings. She makes for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and dyed in purple. Here we're given an insight into her further weaving talents, warp and wolf, okay? Uh, bed coverings refers to the making the items of the bed soft, comfortable, attractive. We don't think about that in the ancient world, do we? Well, she did. Uh, look at the words she makes all by herself and all by her hands. The final word in the top line, look at that, herself. See, she's got an eye for detail. She wants it to be a certain way in accordance with her own taste. That's the idea here. Which takes us to line two, her clothing. Surprise, surprise, her clothing is 
the finest in the ancient Near East. You wouldn't think that, would you? This woman of strength, you'd think she would just uh, be dressed like an ordinary comrade, but she's not. No. Um, gentlemen, take care of your wife. Take care of your wife. Do you really need that brand new alligator golf bag uh, that you've been dreaming about for the last 11 months? Uh, do you really need that new set of clubs? Spend it on your wife. That's uh, Proverbs 31, verse 22, by the way. Adorn your wife. She is your representative in life. Give her the best of what you can. This valiant woman is wearing the best of. Wool dyed with purple. Now, in order to have purple in the ancient Near East, you had to pay for an expensive process. It was brought in by trade ships. It didn't occur in Israel. The, the Phoenicians developed a process of creating purple by using seashells. And to wear those colors, one displayed an appetite for luxury and quality. That is the virtuous woman. Here's 23, the acrostic in. Her husband is respected at the city gate. Now, this is the first mention of the husband in all this context of the virtuous woman. Do you know where this verse occurs? Right in the center of all this structure. What is being taught to us? All this activity and her husband is the centerpiece of all of her activity. He's the focal point of the strong woman. She's the very epitome of the helper that God designed her to be for her purpose in the garden. The thought among most teachers here is that her excellence allows her husband to be free from all kinds of duties that he may focus on a broader range of subjects. Look at the word respected. It means to be known. This is the good name that we have emphasized all the way through the book of Proverbs. How much better is a good name than silver and gold? What will we say when we take you away and we all stand under that big green tent out there wrestling or the garden of tranquility or whatever? What are we going to say? I was looking at the New York Post the other day. And I was grieved at a picture. Uh, the picture was of the great football player, Steve McMichael, University of Texas, All-American. Probably, I would say, one of the top five players that ever came out of that university. Um, why? Well, he played 13 years in pro ball. Nobody does that as a defensive lineman anymore. Uh, they just don't. He played 13 years for the Chicago Bears. Um, he 
was diagnosed two years ago with ALS. And the picture was him on his bed and it took my breath away. I wanted to cry. He may be 110 pounds. Horrible. What that disease does and how it ravages you. And I quoted Isaiah chapter 40 in verse 8, looking at that picture. The grass wither, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever. I would certainly hope that somebody would take that Word of God to that man that's dying uh, and so frail and so weak. He is not a shadow of what he was. You can't even hardly know who he was. He was the late Buddy Ryan's favorite player in the famous 46 defense, 1985, the Chicago Bears. Why, you didn't score on that defense. You were lucky to get a first down on that defense. It was so powerful and dominating in pro football. And I just, it took my breath away. How do you want to be remembered? What you're living for today, what you're doing today, shapes the way we're going to think about you when your life is over. And it's going to be over for all of us. This valiant woman, she made her life about her husband. He was the centerpiece of her life. That's what... The context is showing us right here. And uh, he sits at the gate. We know the gate of the city where judgments occur, where counsel is set forth. The gate is the symbol of power. Now look at your text. It says when. Don't run over that word. What is when? When? Remember, when is temporal? What is temporal? Well, it's time, it's place. We say, when General Patton took over the Seventh Army, we had, a, we had a complete paradigm shift, didn't we? That's when. It's a marker. That's the way we think about when. Theologically, we think about when as a providence. When I heard the gospel, when someone started teaching me the Bible, from when to then, that's the way we think. Don't run over when. Think through these words. Ponder these words. Absorb these words. It's more than memory. It is get yourself entrenched and bathe in these words. And the, the Word of God will come to you like a three-dimension picture. You'll see all things that you have never seen before. And it really intrigues you to meditate on it. So when? He is sitting. The idea of disseminating wisdom. Teaching the skill for living. That's what her husband does. The elders is a reference to the highest local authority prior to the establishment of the monarchy when David became king. After David's rule, what about these elders? Well, they took over the major cities, townships in ancient Israel, and they would give counsel, guidance, direction. They were the law courts, these elders. Concerning the land, because you see, all the law was tied to the land. And so they would prescribe and judge authoritatively the land. Here's 24. The acrostic S, garments she makes and sells. Sashes she supplies to the merchants. This opening garment is the notion of quality. 
well-known, well-respected, her name and her label. She made a market for her clothing business. She made a market for her catering business. Um, hide products here. And so she is making, she is selling. Her efforts are advancing the family through these raw products. And then she assembles them together and she sells them. Very impressive. Very impressive. Here's a visual depiction of what she is doing. Sashes. A garment for the waist associated with the word to gird, which we looked at last time. Verse 17. The word sashes is associated with women's garments. And you can put down Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 24. Because she literally supplies, which means to give to, to deliver to these merchants. Merchants here, merchants there, buying, selling, trading. It's a remarkable feat, this woman. Verse 25, strength and majesty are her clothing. And so she laughs at the coming days. Now, what's that about? Acrostically, it is the letter I. Culturally, in the Old Testament, to put on clothing displayed one's life at the time. So, when one was in humility, he would put on burlap. Today, we wear black. That is associated with mourning, respect. Or we think of the black armband that you see men wear. It's a sign of respect for something or someone, whatever's happening. With this image of her clothing, look, strength. That word is used of endearing energy. Majesty, a way, a characteristic, a manner that sets her off from her peers. Proverbs 20, 29. We had this word splendor in associated with young men's strength, but now it's used for this woman. We have the word majesty, which was previously associated with white hair. I wish I had some white hair. I wish I just had hair. But that day's gone. They were the superlatives of the man. So this is our understanding of our woman of valor here. Line two, none of us know the future. I don't want to know the future. But God knows. God's got a plan. He's got a purpose. And He works it out in His providence. See, the providence is how the plan works. We ask about a testimony from someone. Give us your testimony. And we go, wow, isn't that amazing how God made all that work and come together. That's His providence. And He's showing it to us all the time. So what is this second line saying to us. Look at the word laughter. Laughter in the Old Testament is associated with a destructive enemy or one who stands in opposition to oneself. That's Psalm 2. For example, the Son of God who is... I believe this is a coronation hymn for Solomon. And I think David wrote it that way. And he crowned the new king. Solomon. And he wrote that the king laughs at those who would oppose him. What is he doing? He's coming to establish. He's coming to set in place his kingdom. That's Psalm 2. 
those who would oppose him and would oppose that process, he laughs at. Now that's not arrogance. No, no. That's not arrogance at all. What is laughter then? It's confidence that God is going to accomplish what he sets out to do. And that is the idea of laughter from this ancient culture. My friends, Jesus Christ is going to return and he is going to establish his kingdom. And I personally believe that kingdom, the head of that kingdom is going to be Jerusalem. And he is going to sit upon the throne of David and he is going to rule the entire world from that throne room. And we are going to be his faithful and loyal servants for his kingdom sake. Now, laughter is not arrogance, but laughter is very important, ladies. It's if you don't learn anything about Proverbs 31, I hope you will learn this about this woman of majesty, strength, integrity, and honor. She does not let obstacles get in her way. So, you married a man, and he's got weaknesses, that you didn't know he would have. Well, what does a woman of virtue do? She didn't roll, roll up and get into a fetal position in the corner and turn the lights off. No, she works through it. That's what the wise woman does. She works in spite of it. Some of you women are here and your husbands are gone. You didn't plan on that. For one reason or another, they left, they left the marriage, they died. You can't count on that. But you're working through the obstacles and you're not going to give in to discouragement. You're going to trust God through it because you know that He has planned that providence for you. We go through the mountain, we don't go around the mountain. You try to go around the mountain, he's got a bigger mountain waiting on the other side. No, we trust him for every step we take. That's this woman, and that's her magnanimous strength. She doesn't give in to discouragement. She embraces it, and she trusts the plan of God with it. I told you a few weeks ago the story of Rosemary Jensen. They were given this property, Bible Study Fellowship. It was outside the confines of the utilities of, the, of San Antonio, Texas. They had to have water to build a campus. What were they to do? They got a company, came in. The company said, this is where we drill for water. We're the experts. We know. We've done all this Technical work. They drill the hole, it's dry. They drill another, it's dry. They drill another, it's dry. She says, stop. What I need to do is I need to go and walk this property and I need to talk to the Lord. That's a woman that didn't give in to discouragement. And she said, the Lord showed me the place. She staked it. They said that doesn't fit the contour of the land. They drilled the well. And there's the water. Don't ask me to explain that. I can't. I won't. I don't. I'm not a claim it, proclaim it guy. I just believe in the power of prayer. And I believe in a righteous woman that is as steady as a bull in a blizzard. And she is not going to be toppled. She is going to face adversity and she is going to trust God for it. And that's why she's strong. 
And that's why the house all works. Praise be to God for women like that. Verse 26 in the acrostic format. Here's the letter P. We haven't heard her speak one time. We've had all this description. Her hands are moving. All this activity. We haven't heard her voice not one time. Not the voice of the virtuous woman. But now we do. Here it is. Verse 26. She speaks for the first time. We listen. Her mouth opens with wisdom, skill. You know those words. Hesed. Loving kindness, loving teaching, loving instruction. Torah, the Word of God to the ancient Israelite. It's on her tongue. She doesn't just read it. She has memorized it. She can speak it. She knows it. And look at the parallels that define this valiant woman. She opens her mouth and it is wisdom. Look at the second line in the parallel. She opens her mouth and it is loving instruction. Loving teaching. And so, when she opens her mouth, what is it? It's Torah. It's the Word. That's what she talks about. That shapes her speech. That shapes her communication. She knows what to say, and more importantly, how to say it. Her tone is covenant loyalty. All the way through the book of Proverbs, we've been talking about tone. It's how you say what you say. Just as important as the content of what you say. And she knows how. She knows just the right tone and temperament to say what she needs to say. You know what this is? This is New Testament from the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 5.19. What does he tell us? Speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs. That's the way we communicate with one another. Here's 27, our last one, letter S. She watches over the affairs you have household, that word is supplied, the food of idleness she does not eat. The teaching of this woman of grace is she exercises vigilance over the household with sustained vigilance. She's always on the ready. Our top line, to watch over, literally to keep a lookout for. That's what the word is. Affairs is really a more interesting word. It means to go as in a pathway. Here's where it's used. Nahum. Nahum. In Texas, we say Nahum. Nahum. But it's Nahum. Uh, Nahum 2.5. Uh, used of the orbit or pathway of the stars. Translated as caravans. In English, uh, also found in Psalm 68, verse 24, translated as a procession, an orderly march or advance. So that's what she does. She does all that she does in an orderly manner, moving forward toward an agenda. Line two, the image, she does not eat. It is the negative of her affairs. She doesn't participate in idleness. She doesn't indulge in foolish habits. But rather, she is attentive to her affairs and they are in a procession and she thinks through them 
from A to Z. And when I was in business, I had two secretaries. And uh, I needed two secretaries. I needed them badly. Uh, after the company sold, I was on my own. Didn't have a secretary. And I realized I'm the most unorganized, undisciplined person on the planet. All these things that these women did for me, now I'm on my own. And it caused me to get down on my knees and ask the Lord to give me an organized mind. Here's the project. Lord, I need an organized mind. Help me to think through these issues. That's what this woman does. She's amazing. But she is you. She's ordinary stuff. She overcomes adversity. She is there for her husband because he's the centerpiece to the family and to her life and to her activities. And she gets the job done. When we close out this study, we will rise up and we will call her magnificent for all that she did and all that she went through. She's an overcomer. Do you know who you are? Do you know who I am? We're overcomers. We accomplish the plan, the pur purpose, and the process that God has given to all of us. That's this woman. And that's what we learn. Let's pray. Thank you, Father for our time of study today in Your Word. Bless these women in this class today. Imbue the spirit of this woman in each and every one of them. And as men, teach us how important, how valuable, how precious our wives are to us and to adorn them as we can with the best of everything because that's what the husband in the book of Proverbs does. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.